What's up, everybody? I'm back. Let's make some metal. I um, wrote a song with a buddy of mine in Sweden. His name is Kallefelt. Um It's very much rooted in uh, old-timey Swedish melodic death metal stuff that we grew up on, and you know, it's probably the genre of music that's closest to my heart, because so, that's kind of what I grew up playing, you know. Um, anyways, let's listen to it a little bit. You get the idea. It's all very angry, even though we're very happy people. So first of all, let's take a look at how I arrange my sessions. This is how I do it. You can do whatever you want. This works for me. Typically, at the top, I have all my vocals. At the very tip of top, I have my lead vocals. As we go farther down, I have my harmonies, chants, fun stuff like that after that. And also, they tend to range in colors of yellow. Excuse me. Um, after that, I have my drums, uh, this is my MIDI drum file, and then whatever automation I do to the drums. Below that, I have my bass. Bass is always brown for me. After that, I have my rhythm guitars that are always shades of red. And then uh, added extra guitars, extra riff guitars, uh, guitar filler, stuff like that. Um, after that, I have my guitar solo that are typically green. And after that, I have everything else. So uh, orchestral uh, elements, uh, synthesizers, blippity bloppity, whatever, sound design stuff I might have going on. And that typically ranges from, you know, turquoise, turquoise to uh, shades of purple for the most part. And this is only so I have a good overview. So when I look at the session, I, I can easily get to whatever it is. I will also delete every audio region that is empty and you can use uh, strip silence for that but i have a video for that to suggest search my uh, search my channel for strip silence because that also makes it much easier to see what's going on as you work on this uh, all that being said let's just take a quick rundown on what i've done to everything and then after that we'll talk about the arrangement and then we'll talk about routing and automation and fun stuff like that cool cool all right let's do it Here's what the drums sound like. Check the chorus. Everything in metal you want to be snappy and, you know, attacky and all that stuff. So the drum plugin I use, Spear Drummer 3, I've made a preset that I call Modern Metal. Um, that's based on their gen style. So I really just started there and uh, made the tweaks that I liked. Um, and I haven't really done that much. Like Superior Tune Track is awesome because it sounds great out of the box. Let's look at the kick drum first. I right, cut some highs because it's really clicky. It's almost too clicky for my bones. Boosted a little bit around 60 ish. Um, because I feel it's a really fast song, and if you have too much boomy or kick drum, uh, it feels really good on the slow sections, but it just gets overwhelming. And also, I'm doing the SSL channel. This is Waves SSL channel. The SSL channel uh, compressor trick, where you set the threshold all the way, and then you just turn up the ratio until you get maybe three to six of so two lights, basically. Also, make sure. Uh, Analog is off, or your whole mix is going to go and you have no idea why. I use the split and the channel out. That way, I it's just routing, so these filters happen before the compressor, and then the EQ after that. Cool beans. All right. What else are we doing with the kick? Just scooping a bunch of mids. Uh, a little bit of a dynamic again. This is just to take more click out, because it's super clicky. And then I pump up those lows ever so slightly. Looks like this. 
Oh yeah, also very important. I'm sending a whole bunch into bus 2, which is here. Bus 2 is my parallel drum compressor. We'll get to that after we go through the channels. Let's check out the snare. Yeah, a bit of high pass, boosting a little bit over 5. And then I have quite a bit of a boost around 220-ish. It's a lot of meat in the snare that happens there. And I like meat in the snare. What else do we have? Yeah, just boosting. Again, this is because I thought it needed it. It's, it all comes down to the, you're making soup, right? Then every plug-in is salt and pepper and, you know, uh, whatever else you, coriander, whatever you toss into your soup. And um, this was the way to make it taste the way I wanted. Why is there a game plugin on this? Oh, all right. Uh, oh, it's because I have automation on it. All right, never mind. Uh, and then also a good trick is a little bit of Saturn. So um, I have the warm tape. Get the dry boosted. Nothing on that one. But it's like I got this set at around 133. Just gives you a little sizzle on the top. Tom's is going to be very much like the kick drum, really. Uh, yeah, boost a little around 8, good for click. Boost a little bit around 150-ish. Let's find some Tom's. Let's see what they sound like. I actually know a drummer named Tom. Feels a little on the nose, but oh well. Uh, is this a fill? This looks like a fill. Let's see what this, like. what this sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, take a little bit of mids out, boost the uh, highs a little bit. Also important, all my shells, kick, snare, uh, toms, they all go to the parallel compressor quite a bit. Overheads. Boost a little super high. Not too much going on here. That's the cell compressor trick again. You know, I thought it needed around 1200. And here I took out some of the, like some of these uh, symbols get really whistly. Sounds like you have crickets in your house. Uh, not a fan of whistle, whistle. Never, as I said, it mixed with all the distortion stuff. It just starts annoying me. You know, we got a 1176. This is the waves. Smash it pretty hard, pretty quick release. Nothing too uh, out of the ordinary. And here's here's something I like to do. Saturn on the overheads. It just gives it nice like overtone harmonics. Uh, it makes it sizzle without getting fizzy. <laughs> of course, right in the break. There we go. And then I pro and be a little bit. This is essentially like a de-esser for the cymbals. I just pro and be a little bit because I felt it was getting a little too, uh, you know, a little too much right there. I like it. in isolation, none of this will make any sense. But when you listen to the whole thing, that's when you start hearing like, oh, yeah, maybe it's building up a little too much. It's real. It happens really easy in metal because we have so much distortion. And distortion is just noise. And then you have your cymbals like the overheads on top of that. And, uh, you know, I just felt it was too much. Uh, the ambiance mics. I feel a lot of the life in the drums happening in the, um, like the room mics. Uh, but yeah, I took some highs out, did the uh, SSL compressor trick. You'll see that SSL compressor a lot. It, I feel it just kind of brings the sound forward a little bit. Makes it feel a little more alive. Bit of high pass, 1176. Yeah, squash it quite a bit. Uh, and I also send a little bit of this, the overhead. So here I have automated a doubler, if I'm not. Yeah, so DBLR, that's my doubler. So basically, I think it's at the very last chorus where everything comes in nice and loud. Let's check it out. <laughs> So wherever I really want to emphasize the drums, I have a little doubler, you know, Swaves doubler, um, automated in on the overheads. So right where the big moment happens, it, it's just a little more drums. 
I just, ha, I can't mute it and solo at the same time. It's pretty subtle, but it, you know, it creates the effect that I want. Just pushes it a little bit more as we get back into that part. All right, so let's look at the, uh, the drum compressor, the parallel compressor. So I have my shells, my kick, snare, and tom, a little bit of uh, overheads too. Still on defense if I like that or not. I'm always changing this stuff up. In this case, and I'm always changing this up, I got uh, Fab Filter Pro C2. If we listen to just this. So really what you want here is just way too much compression. So I let the attack sit to where I get some transients through. It's pretty quick with the release. And then, you know, high on the ratio, pretty thick with the threshold. Because I want this to really, really, you know, just squash the living piss out of it. And then I route my drum compressor into my drum bus. So let me play you the drums with and without the, the parallel drums, uh, parallel compressor. just punchier it feels closer it obviously gets a little louder too but that's something i would never do without i don't know why i have an eq there but it's just you know i try something and turn it off and forgot about it let's see what's going on on the drum bus got the ssl compressor trick again what a shocker right but a little more subtle this time around we have the old ssl yeah i stack a lot of compressors so this guy is just kissing kissing the drum bus and it just adds a little bit of glue it's very very subtle yeah the meter is barely moving if even at all i have a little saturn here's and we have the mix all the way down at 40 percent so we got the clean tube drive is not very high also this is very subtle i do a lot of very subtle things you know I typically don't do very very broad strokes with anything. All right, and because I'm a psycho, I have put a Pro C2 in parallel compression mode. And what does that mean? It means I have the dry at uh, zero dB and I have the wet gain. I start by turning it all the way down and then I absolutely super crush, you know, let enough transients through super quick and just infinite ratio basically but then this is the wet gain so it's very subtle but what this does is it just like pulls the transients through a little bit it's all that compression and stuff i've done before it pulls the transients back out a little bit check it out just feels like the drummer is a little closer in here does it not and then i have a little bit of limiter in this Just, just taking the, uh, if it sticks out a little too much. Because I don't want my master bus uh, compressors uh, to get upset with me. Here's an interesting thing. What does this bus do on the drum bus? Huh? It goes down here to a uh, bus that I call Room. And here's a really good trick if you dabble in digital recording like I do. Nothing I record is in a room, so I have to sort of like fake one. Um, I have a EQ in front, just with a high pass, low pass. And then I typically set this to around 0 0.33 seconds, around ish there. And then I'm going to mix all my instruments I like to pretend are in the same space. So we got the drums, we got the bass, we got the uh, rhythm guitars, we're going to get the vocals. And what that will do is like it will take all these digital recreations of instruments because I record real amps but into IRs, so fake cabs. Bass goes straight in for the most part. The drums is also pure drummer. So to give it a little bit of that effect of back in the day when you recorded real instruments in a big room, um, I can fake that a little bit. So that is what that is. And let's see what just that sounds like. Yeah, it's like a room mic in a big uh, recording space. 
let's see what else is going on. Oh, by the way, there's a bridge section here where I do a bunch of finagna with the drums. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I have a I have an extra snare this whole time. I forgot to tell you about that. Why do I have an extra snare? Snare. I thought it sounded cool. And that one is also routed into drum bus. And just for reference, let me mute the extra snare, and then I'll uh, add it back in, and we'll see what it sounds like. I feel it makes the snare a little bit longer. There's a little more up mid fat and it just gets a little longer. And I think it sounded good. That's why it's there. Uh, silicon side stick is for my side chaining on the guitars. We'll talk about that when we get to it. And I have automated a couple of things. I have a couple of tricks. This is all this trick in the book, but I got a reverse snare. And that's just a snare hit that I recorded and reversed in logic. Um, but as that goes with the drums here, and I've also added on that snare drum, I've automated in a distorted reverb that's much longer uh, than my regular reverb. Oh, one thing I should say about routing on the drums too. My snare reverb, which uh, is hanging out over here somewhere, is also, just uh, Valhalla room, nothing too crazy. Uh, two things I do, I compress it because it makes it more audible. Then I route my snare reverb into my parallel uh, drum compressor. So this, my snare reverb goes into bus two, which is my drum parallel compressor. And that in turn goes into the drum bus. And uh, after all that, we have a drum sound that I quite like. And then in that bridge, when we listen to the whole track, uh, you'll hear how that extra reverb comes in and it's just like big and noisy and dirty and gross. Actually, let's listen to it. Uh, should be in here somewhere. Oh yeah, dist verb. Check it out. <laughs> That's not a pretty sound at all, right? But that's exactly what I wanted for this kind of, it's more of a, an ambient part. Season to taste. Figure out what you want to cook and then season to taste. You know, when I started learning mixing, I would ask really good mixers, so how do you do it? And they're like, yeah, I just tweak it until it sounds good. So, okay. So here I am 12 years later telling you guys to tweak until it sounds good. Let's check out the bass. So what you're hearing is my Dingwall combustion bass, five string bass. It's freaking awesome. I love it. I, all the bass I record, I do with that. Now here's my trick. I will split the bass signal into uh, twine tracks. On the one that is my clean one, I use this um, uh, uh, Universal Audio Ampeg SVT Classic. And this is my favorite bass sound in the whole world. This is the bass tone I've longed for. Fucking awesome. Love it. And then I have 1176 on that. I'm trying to not crush the bass. Just, just kiss it. Take the, take the uh, peaks out of it. Then, of course, I crush it with a... That's actually not that bad, but I put a limiter on because I don't want my bass to run away from me. The second bass track, still same bass, just going into two different places. I run that through a couple of dark glass distortion pedals, uh, whatever they're called. And then I take all the low end out. I take more low end out or a high end because it, in this case it just turned into be too much like not isolated but with everything playing I just felt it was too much I smack it with a uh, limiter and then here's one of my favorite secret weapons that enveloper can add or 
decrease transient attack. I used this a ton. So between there was being, I felt there was too much. Let's just listen to that. Part. Why would I put that in my mix? Well, when we blend it in, it sounds pretty cool. One I let me mute both of these actually. Mixed in with the whole bass. And then in context with everything else. I felt there was too much up here. So I put some uh, multiband compression on it. Right there, I felt it was too much. Uh, but that made me lose a little bit of the attack, because a lot of the attack happens right here. So I put it back in with the enveloper. Hell yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And I don't think I did any automation on the bass. Nope, doesn't seem like it. So this is the bass bus, so this is the combination of my SVT Classic, the dark glass pedals. Pretty cool. I'm using the SSL compressor trick again. Uh, nothing else going on there. Absolutely love Universal Audio's 1176. It's one of those things you, you just turn it on and everything sounds better. Uh, I felt like there was too much of this and not enough of that, so I added that. And up here is a tricky frequency because it can, in isolation, sound really weird, but it really marries the bass to the guitars quite nicely. I used to scoop all that out. Oh, it sounds like shit. And it's like, why is my bass and guitar not fitting together at all? That's because I scooped everything out. All righty, what do we got here? We got a bunch of 15K. We got a bunch of 5K. Thank you, Chris Lord Algae. And I think that's it. Yep. And again, like the number one thing with all this is make sure it sounds good on the way in. When you record it, get your tones, make it sound, make sure it sounds good, make sure the arrangement is good, make sure the takes are good or good enough. I don't think I've ever done a good take, but good enough. Um, and look, I used the same parallel expression trick on the bass bus as I did the drum bus. I like compression, what can I say? And a very low band just to control some of the uh, lower chunka chunka chunka. And then I got that same room reverb that I had on the uh, drums. It's on the bass and it's also on the guitars. Cool. Lucky me. Let's uh, check out the guitars. Oh, and what I will do is like after I have my drum sound set, you know, so uh, drums are chugging along. Then I tried to find a nice balance with the bass. Sounds pretty cool. And then I started tweaking my guitars. Here's my guitar trick. I recorded uh, both uh, into the amp. This is a 14 sigil. You can see it back there, 14 sigil. Best 1200 bucks you'll ever spend on a metal amp. I, you know, this is the hill I will die to is the best low mid price metal amp out there uh it's absolutely incredible and if you can't buy a 14 meshuggah you know one of those six seven thousand dollar amps get the sigil it's dope so i recorded that and i also did a di and i'm gonna show you how i panned them but uh, i basically have two uh, guitar tracks uh called one and three <laughs> And if it looks like I've recorded this two bars at a time, you're absolutely right. Because uh, I, I wrote it and I recorded it right away. So rather than me uh, practicing for two, uh, two weeks and then trying to get a longer good take, I was like, all right, I'm just going to record it two bars at a time. Here's what I did. So we have a guitar one here, right? But I also took a DI of that very same take. So my... Guitar one and two are the same take. It's just this is a DI. And uh, let me show you what I do with the DI. Hell yeah. I got the uh, neural archetype Petrucci. So this is the sigil and the 
Petrucci, and hard left, and not hard right, a little closer to the center. You'll also hear that the sigil is much louder. That is like my, my main guy. And this is just kind of the henchman with the ponytail and the Uzi that's, that gets killed, you know. Um, it's just for filler. It's just to take up more real estate in the mix. But it works really well. What you got to do, though, is make sure you nudge it a little bit. And in the logic, that's option arrow. So either nudge it back or forward. Because if they're lined up, it's going to face uh, to all heavens. And we don't want that. So just the, uh, and then I did the same thing with my second guitar. So this is really my second guitar, fourth, and, and then the, here's the DI. That's basically it. So together, they sound like this. So let's see what's going on. Guitar one looks like this. Uh... And I, I got this RDX core, but I don't know if it's activated actually because I just got the license. Nah, I, I got to give some money to some people. Uh, I pass a little bit, and then I haven't really touched it. And... Yeah, that's it. What else did I do? Oh, yeah, Renaissance Axe. That's an old waves classic. Yeah, I, you got to be real careful with this one. But I feel it adds a little bit of attack. It brings the guitar a little closer. And that's a little tack, but it's also really love to start pumping, so be careful. All right. And then what else do we have? Universal Audio API. So I love this one for additive EQ because it sounds really good. Like this high register sounds amazing. So I use this on bass a lot and you know whatever else is going on. Um so yeah, it's just adding a little bit of high end. I think that's literally the only thing. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I've done the exact same thing on the other channel. And let's look at the doublers. So it's Archetype Petrucci. And then I have I Pass a little bit. A little bit of the SSL uh, trick with the compressor. Where am I? Renaissance Axe. Oh, yeah, it's, this is interesting. If Joe had one a sec ever watched this, he'd be proud. Uh, so, distorted guitars tend to uh, whistle a lot. You can add a pshhh. So, I just took some of that out. And then that Pro and B is just to uh, tame some of the chuk 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 chuk. Because what happens really is, is like all the palm muting uh, gets way louder. And then, you know, that can make your whole uh, mix pump and stuff like that. This is not the kind of pump up the jam that we want. Here is some interesting stuff. Why do we have two Pro and Bs after each other? Well, it's because I'm a side chaining maniac. So, um, uh, a huge challenge always is getting the vocal to be heard, especially when you have dense, dense guitar mixes, like we tend to do in metal. So one way of doing that is to sidechain the vocal to the guitar. And this seems really extreme, and it is really extreme, but this is my filler guitars. Uh, on the main guitar, I'm much more subtle, but every time uh, Kala starts singing, um, this Pro and B instance will push it down. Well, let's uh, actually listen to it so we got a feel for what's going on. So he starts singing right around here. So here it keeps like going up and down in volume, right? And it's really like, it's not even, it's volume a little bit, but it's almost more like the bright brightness tends to go down all the time. But if we listen to the vocal on top of that, it starts to make sense, right? He's here. The corrupter of mankind, the seven reprieser, the serpent and the contrary. The object of perversion, spotted and lapis. So pretty cool, right? Every time he sings, I take out a bit of volume and high end on the rhythm guitars. So that way, his voice doesn't fight with the guitar so much. And I don't have to automate every word he sings. Works for me if it works for you. 
All right, so it may, may look like I have a million uh, plugins on my rhythm guitar track here, and that's because I do. And what I do a lot is if I, I basically I mix until it stops annoying me. When I'm not annoyed anymore, I'm done. So I'm listening to something. It's like, yeah, it feels like there's a little too much high end or that one note is a little this and that. And a lot of times I'll just like add a plugin to fix that one thing. Because if I go farther up in the chain and say, I, all right, there's too much, um, there's not enough bass in this one guitar track. So I add more bass, but then there's a compressor after. And now the compressor is going to react differently because there's more or less information going into it. And that changes everything. And then I have to go in and tweak the compressor. And then I have to tweak the next thing. So if there's something that I hear that annoys me, I'm just going to add something to fix it. And, you know, computers are powerful enough these days. So you can do this pretty easily. Like, I, I don't think I've ever maxed out the session. So that's why you see a lot. And some of these you'll see is for very specific reasons. So let's just see what's going on. Yeah, almost nothing there. A little bit of high pass. Um, the wee bit more of the Renaissance act. And a little more attack, a little brighter. And this is essentially the old Andy Sneep trick. He would do it in C4 and wave C4 multiband, but you know, it's just right where the, you can even see it on the EQ graph. Every time I palm mute, there's this big spike in the low end. It's just to control that. Uh, yeah, that's one I was just looking at. And then we have the API, adding a whole bunch around 15, adding a bunch around, was that eight? Adding a little bit around 100 too. Uh, just give it a little more meat. Now what's going on? Oh, yeah, we got some whistling Dixie. Check this out. Yeah, circadas and crickets in my house. And it's funny because if I play this and then mute this, those frequencies, is everything you're going to hear. Check this out. Now it's like this one's laughing in your face. So, it's just one of those things. And then what else we have? Yeah, I guess it's got to be... Actually, let's figure out when that happens. Uh, where's the rhythm guitar? Here's the rhythm guitar. Yes, it's this guy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So during the bridge, uh, it sounds like this. I just thought it was too much of that frequency right there, which is why it's there. That makes sense, right? And then the next one we have, oh yeah, and this is like a filter effect right before. This is also, oh, it's over here. Let's check that out. Piece of piece, right? You know, it's, it's just a easy filter effect. And in context, it sounds like this. Pretty cool. What else is going on? Well, we have the chorus. We have a bunch of filters. And this is stuff I do arrangement-wise to uh, fill it up and make it sound bigger. Well, that sounds like it's pumping, uh, and that's because I have this. Um, you can't see it here, but where it's routed to, this is also being pushed out of the way by the vocal through side chaining. But yeah, it's just four tracks. And I've done nothing to those tracks at all then I don't even high pass. Man, I am out of my mind. Here I do the high pass, uh, and then I get a little bit on the sides. I felt it was too much here, I guess. 
And this is then routed to something I call ambience. Now what that is, it's an EQ, high pass, low pass. Every time I say low pass, I think of low pan from Big Trouble in Little China. I have a really long reverb, which is, you know, beautiful. And I have a delay with uh, quite a bit of stuff or just delay, I guess. And then I compress the living Jesus out of it. Just kidding. I'm not compressing that very hard at all. I think I'm just using a little makeup gain on it. But that is basically my ambiance. So whenever I need something to be really big and spacey, uh, I send it to that bus and that takes care of it. Then that in turn is sent out here, but that's the difference. That's for later. Um, and yeah, that pumping you're hearing is because on my filler channel. So this is getting into routing a little bit, but I have my analog summing mixer from Dangerous Music. I got a two bus plus. So I'm just routing all of these fellas out here. So this is where all my sound ends up. It goes into the can under my table. And uh, I have all of these sidechain to my vocal. So whenever uh, Kala says anything, I have a sidechain on the mid channel because I want him to be dead center, right? So. That pumping you're hearing is uh, when his beautiful voice comes in. Now you don't hear this at all in context as if he is, uh, or the music is like dipping around him. You just hear this as the vocal being real loud and clear. Pretty cool, right? Because it's always a challenge. Like I said, dense, dense mixes, lots of instrumentation, lots of tracks. How do we get the vocal to both sit in the mix and be really audible uh, without it being too loud? And, you know, side chaining is uh, what gets me through trouble. There's a few other things on the guitars that could be worth just from a wrenching perspective. Whenever there's heavy shit like I have here. <laughs> I've just quad tracked, so this is just two more tracks. Right? I think that's a metal zone, actually. So that's the guitar into metal zone, out of the metal zone, into the power amp section of a, uh, this angle right here, actually. Um, and then uh, I recorded that twice. And then the next part that comes up... I want that meow to be a little more emphasized. Yeah, so I just recorded that extra. I think that might be the metal zone too. But that's it for arranging guitars on the verse, chorus, and the riff parts. Then we have this whole bridge section. <laughs> talk about that um, we have a bunch of instruments guitar and then just double take and then we got some electric piano because here's one of my guilty pleasures uh, I love doubling clean uh, guitars with electric piano I just think it sounds cool man And it feels like it has weird swells. It's because it does. Check this out. I like uh, swelly, swelly things. So let me see where I put it. Did I do it with this compressor? Yeah, I did. So we have a little fella here. Snappy snare. And what that is, it's just uh, Logic's drum synthesizer. Um, that I've just put a snare. And it doesn't even have an output. 
so it doesn't make any sound, but it can still send signal to other places. So on my electric piano, which you're hearing right now, So what the hell is going on with this fella, you ask? Well, that is my snappy snare sidechain. So I've just taken the sidechain here, a snappy snare, and uh, oh, what am I doing? So every time, I don't know what I do with this thing. Um, every time the sidechain hits, it's going to trigger the compressor on the... Uh, on the electric piano, it gives us this because I set the release time really slow. It has this really like weird swelling effect that in context with all the other things that's also routed to that snappy snare. <laughs> it almost makes it feel like the old mix is breathing in time with the music. And I think that's super cool. I used a similar thing when the guitar solo comes in because I wanted it to be like just the guitar note on the first one, everything kind of just coming out and then zoop, coming back in. Give it a little more in that. So instead of automating a hundred tracks, I just like make one compressor. Uh, I got the snappy snare again, again without any output. I have one hit on that, and then I'll just copy that compressor to all the channels that I want out of the way, and, and that creates the effect that I want. Cool. The band comes in. It's metal again. And just to listen to the instrumentation, there's a bunch of stuff going on here. More is more. All right, that one's muted. This is one of my favorites. It's a very Vangelis. It's a, in the stock retro synth. There's a you know, logic. There's a preset called the Berlin Experience. Love it. You hear it on a lot of stuff I do. If we listen to all the keys and the bass, that is Swedish for you, by the way. Holy smokes, Batman, that's a lot of stuff going on. Let's look at the vocals. Because uh, Kalle, uh, the singer, is a beast. Uh, he made this really easy to mix. Because he knows what he's doing, and he's a pro. And uh, he recorded straight. He used a Neumann 47 clone straight into his board. But I can't remember what it was, so don't get mad at me. And he did double takes and everything, and it's tight, and it sounds great. And hell yeah, let's go. The corrupter of mankind, the shadow rip of your soul. Seems like there's a lot here, but really it's just like me tweaking a tiny thing at a time and ending up with a ton of ton of plugins. Um, boosting a whole bunch, high pass, because uh, I felt like the lows in his vocal track uh, got in the way of guitar bottom and middle of the bass. The corrupter of mankind, the shadow rip of your soul. Then I felt there was a bunch of uh, don't want this around the here. The corrupter of mankind, the shadow rip of your soul. I just took some of that out. The corrupter SSL compressor trick. You got some de-esser. The corrupter of mankind. And in case you don't know, de-esser is just a multiband compressor that just works the high frequencies. Hey, we got the uh, distressor. I just got this plugin. The corrupter of mankind, the shadow rip of your soul, the cybertechnical drum. Also, the distortion uh, effects here are 
awesome. I understand why this is so popular. The corrupt are all the Again, 1176, just kissing his vocal. Got a bit of Saturn. That's a little harmonic um, information on top without getting sisly. And here's something I actually picked up from Logic themselves. It's a stereo delay with the mix almost turned off. And then limiter to make sure it doesn't run away. No one's doing too much. Hey, here's a lot of stuff. Let's see what's going on here. So bus 18, that's my room. Remember I talked about uh, everything like being in the same space a little bit more? This guy here, this is my Bricasti. Bricasti, what are you called? M7? Uh, I use it for things that are nice, so vocals tend to get some of it. I've changed the settings though, so it shouldn't be this long. And then we have, oh yeah, here's another metal trick I like to use. I set up a uh, Pro Q3 with the telephone preset. Of course, now we can't hear it. Um, but mixed in. The corrupt are all mankind. They shall not rip me aside. It adds a nice mid range quality that by itself sounds like absolute ass, but in the mix, it sounds good. And then I have a little parallel compression on the vocal. That really brings out transients and stuff without necessarily making the vocal that much louder. Uh, by itself, sounds like this. And in context, sounds like this. And because Kelly is a pro and a bro, he did double takes and everything. Thank you very much. So this purposely sounds like ass on its own. And most of it is the same, but what I've done is I've uh, distorted it much harder. Yeah, that was the solo. So, you know, I drive it much, much harder with the Saturn and also I probably squash it much harder. And then I got the old doubler. So what this will do, and also 19, which is to get a little bit of bricasting. So if we listen to just the main vocal. The corrupt are all mankind. They shall not rip me aside. And we add the doubler, uh, the second track vocal with the doubler. The corrupt are all mankind. They shall not rip me aside. So you still have his main vocal right in your face, but now it sounds like he's sort of haunting you on the sides too. And it really makes a difference uh, in the mix. Let's listen without the extra vocal. So again, it doesn't sound louder. It just sounds like there's more of them somehow. Um, I also have something I picked up from Joey Sturgis. Thank you, Joey. It's a delay throw. And that is just like, instead of me automating delay up and down, which is going to drive me crazy. I think I did that anyways, by the way. Um, I just put a second track, so where I want those big delay vocals. And since that's the only thing that happens on the, that channel, it makes it much, much easier for me to mix it. Uh, what else we have? Hey, this vocal sidechain is worth talking about. I will make a copy uh, on its own track and throw every part of the vocal up there. So no matter where he sings it, if it's a verse or a chorus, it's going to be up here. And then I set it so it has no output. And then I'm going to use that for all my compressors, like when I want to multiband uh, the guitars uh, to multiband, uh, you know, when he sings to push down the uh, high frequencies and stuff like that. I'm going to use the vocal sidechain. Otherwise, since I like to use different channels for different parts of the song, I probably don't want the chorus to sound exactly like the verse. So instead of having to put two multiband compressors for the guitar, one for the verse vocal and one for the uh, chorus vocal, I just make uh, like a master sidechain vocal track. And then I just use that for all my sidechain needs. There's another cool thing. Actually, let's look at the chorus first. See what's going on here. 
Yes, yeah, so it's it's pretty similar. Like not too much has changed from the verse vocal. It might be a little bit louder because he's competing with more stuff, and I also want the chorus to feel a little, a little more energetic. So yeah, not a whole lot difference here. He's a real nice guy. So now we got some answers, and I know I messed with those quite a bit. So yeah, uh, let's take a look at that. Actually, we got some interesting stuff. I've you know crushed it and distorted it, the, you know Saturn for the distortion, and I think I did an interesting thing here. Uh, that's the parallel compression, and here's stereo delay, and then this guy. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. So let me just play this in context first, so you can hear it. Uh huh. Like I wanted the answers to sound like they're coming from somewhere else. So I pushed those way out to the sides, but that also made them lose their uh, gusto a little bit and sort of get lost in the mix. So, all right, so how do we fix that? Because I haven't panned out, as you can see, like this is the answer vocals and by themselves. They sound like this. And I made these sound ugly on purpose, but like in context, uh, we can turn that off just to see what it sounds like. It kind of disappears a little bit. So, all right, so it's because they're on the side and nothing on the side is ever going to be as powerful as something that's right uh, down the pipe. So I put a uh, distortion. Sorry, I got to look around my camera because it's right in the way. Um, I put a distortion uh, channel as a send. And what that is, it's actually a Universal Audio's Marshall Plexi. Um, so this is on a mono channel along with those side answers together. It sounds like this. And all of a sudden we hear it really loud and clear in the mix again. Well, that's pretty cool. Then we have the chance. And what this is, I went to YouTube search sound effect chance. And of course, there was no one that chanted, hey, hey, just the way I wanted. So I had to get a little creative. Um, there's a long reverb on that guy. There's a distorted reverb on that guy. And a stereo delay. And I think, if I'm not tripping, yeah, yes, I got that side chained for the main vocal enveloper. Yeah, maybe I didn't do as much to it as I thought I did. Oh yeah, no, I actually did. So this guy here, that's just like a a stadium. Oh, so we do this. Okay, that's my. Uh, that was just like one long continuous. Ah. All right. So what can we do about that? Because uh, I want it to be. Hey, with the rest of them but i felt that the two on their own wasn't enough so i put a noise actually if i turn it up let's see what it sounds like so that was the sound it's just like a soccer crowd or cheering whatever it was so i put a noise gate that i side chained to a snappy snare it's always snappy snare which is down here so the noise gate is always active, except for when this guy hits. And when this guy hits, the noise gate opens, which corresponds with when I want those uh, chants to be in there. If we look at the noise gate while I play it. Pretty cool, right? I love mixing. You get to be creative. So that's how I got around that. Actually, let me check one more thing. It's been a little while since I mixed this. I don't necessarily remember all of it perfectly. Oh, yeah, and I send this uh, sports chant to my uh, to my Marshall Plexi. 
because it just wasn't enough noise. So let's look at the routing and with that analog summing mixer. You don't need this at all. I bought one because I thought it seemed cool, and it was cool. I got a dangerous audio. I'll put a picture up here of my uh, outboard gear. So here's what's going on. I route everything um, depending on what it is, starting with the drums. They go to, ooh, I route these to 7, 8. The bass is routed to 5, 6. So <clears throat> on the one I have, the 2 bus plus, uh, there's two of the channels you can set to mono. So the bass is routed mono, and the vocals, the uh, lead guitars, anything I want dead center, I route to the mono channels. So bass is routed 5, 6, which is a mono channel. Rhythm guitars go to 9, 10. And you see, every, nothing here goes to a stereo out. Everything goes. I have my fillers in 11, 12. Got the solo. Oh, I solo in this case to 11, 12. Usually I route that to 13, 14. That's probably because I have some, yeah, I have the stereo delay. That's why. Um, the bridge stuff goes to 15, 16. So I get these outputs right here. And here you can see my bass drums, guitar, filter, lead, filter, and effects. I route all my uh, effects, reverbs, and stuff to its own channel. And this is just like adding an, uh, an extra bus. Um, you know, there's really no difference. It's just now it goes through some outboard stuff. And it gives it, it has some pretty nice saturation uh, options that I use. And here's more stuff I do with almost everything. All my buses, and I'm always uh, experimenting with this, but this is how I did this mix. All my buses more or less have some compression on them. And it's very, very gentle. Like this is a drum bus out. And then like filler stuff, I tend to squeeze harder. The synthesizers, like the for me, um, 11, 12, and 15, 16. That's where I route my fillers, my ambient stuff, all that. I tend to squeeze those a good bit harder. And then you see there's Pro and B and a bunch of them. And this is just... My vocal sidechain, every time Kyle sings anything, it's going to push down these frequencies to leave more room for him. Um, it's just like scooping out that nice little pocket for the vocal to sit in without me having to raise it up so it gets so loud. And here's a cool thing I did with the guitars, and this works really well. Good old Pro Q3. I've, uh, when I listen to it, it's just like, it feels like he is competing around this frequency range with the guitars. All right, uh, I load the guitars now, I don't hear the riff. I raise the guitars, but I, I scoop those frequencies out. Now the guitars sound really dull. Ugh, you know, big picture stuff here. So what I did was I created a, um, a band right here. I routed it to the vocal sidechain again. So every time he sings, it's gonna dip out with the dynamic EQ right here then that's it and then i boosted a little bit and i took a little bit out here because i felt it needed it but like if we listen to just this uh so it's pretty cool the guitar still sounds like the guitar and every time he's not singing, it's, it's beefy and bright and all that. But when he comes in, it's just like the total amount of frequency is kind of the same. Because when he comes in, you know, we add and we subtract the same amount. So it just really is a nice way of, uh, it's a subtle way of creating more space for the vocal. Uh, then what I do, then I route all of these, go... Um, out into my outboard gear and here's a crazy thing I tried on this track but it worked pretty cool so I might use this I have a JST clip in the two-time mode that I, I think this is supposed to be here I might have moved must have moved it by mistake uh, about 3 dB and then I trim it by the same amount mix it at 100 and then this in turn goes into my outboard stuff which is I'll put a picture up for you this is how I got it routed because the uh, cables going out the back. This goes into a compressor and a couple of mag, what they call EQ4, that I really only use for uh, the air band. Um, and 
And then uh, on the compressor, it just absolutely barely kissed the meter. I have a uh, Pro-Q3 here on my master bus. And then, of course, all that goes back into the computer. It's my master bus. I have a real knack of scooping too much around here-ish. So I'm just adding a little bit of it back in. That, in turn, goes into Comprime. The 2 to 1 ratio, 1 to 2 uh, dBs of compression, really slow attack, fast release. Here's another thing I use, Magic Mastering in FabFilter Saturn 1, but the mix is set to 0. It's very subtle, but it adds a little bit of harmonic, a little bit of, little bit of harmonic uh, information. Here's the next crazy thing I do. This is the same parallel compressor trick that I used on the, was it the bass or the rhythm guitar and the drums. Dry is at zero, wet gain, uh, cease to taste very, very gently. This is master bus, so any small deviation is going to make a, uh, small variation is going to make a huge change. So yeah, it's compressing a load, right? But I only have this much wet going. And this just brings out the transients ever so gently. So pretty quick attack, very fast release, and just a teeny tiny. And hey, you do you. Do whatever you want. You don't have to do what I do. I think this sounds cool. That's why I do it. I got the Gulf Foss. Thank you, Nolly, for the recommendation about Recover 20, Tame 10. And this is because I don't trust my listening environment or my ears. <laughs> Definitely add some. The room I'm in is both very boomy and very bright. So even with treatment in here, it's hard to be sure. This feels like an extra layer. Of, it's like wearing a condom a little bit. You know, you're still going to enjoy it, but it's a little safer. And then I stack limiters because I'm uh, crazy like that. And that is everything that is going on in this song. Let me know if you found this helpful. Uh, what you would like to see next. Like and subscribe to all those things. And I'll put the uh, Spotify link to where you can listen to this and bang your head at home. And uh, let me know if you want to hear more music from us. Also, the track that's on Spotify was very lovingly mastered by Eric Hill. So thank you, Eric Hill. Cool. I think that's it. Hope you learned something. I had a good time. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.